We know how much you love our Richard Edens reactions to Royal Family News and boy, do we have some good ones this week. Hello, Happy New Year and welcome to Palace Confidential. I'm Jo Elvin and this week we have a very special episode featuring pretty much one man, the one, the only, Richard Eden. His forthright opinions always get you talking in the comments section so we've dedicated an entire episode to them. Before we hear them though, a reminder to subscribe to our channel, that way you'll never miss the straight talking dicky or any of our other royal experts ever again. So without further ado, here are some of Richard's righteous royal reactions. Well, I'm not sure it was that sudden. Okay. I mean, they've, they've been given plenty of notice, so they've got to move out, well, move their things out. I think it's by, um, by June, so after the coronation. And apparently they were told in January, it just happened to coincide with um, the publication of Prince Harry's memoir, Spare. Um, so I think we can probably um, assume that the two <laughs> things might be connected. But I just, I mean, this, this reaction I'm hearing from sort of, you know, Harry and Meghan's cheerleaders, oh, they're so shocked, they're so surprised. What on earth did he expect? You know, I mean, my goodness, you know, if I started writing a book about how dreadful my family were, you know, and then doing a TV program stretched over weeks for, you know, being insulting them day after day, you know, I would expect some sort of reaction. You, you would be evicted from one of your family's houses. Yeah, they might cut <laughs> yeah. off my pocket money or whatever. Um, you know, and the, the fact is, you know, they had this, um, you know, lovely property, and it's a special arrangement. You know, it's a really, you know, it's an honor to have it. And you know they weren't using it obviously for um, the vast majority of the year anyway, and you know why should they be allowed to? You know they've left the royal family. They made a big song and dance about it. You know now they can use some of their millions to spend it. Um, you know on staying at a hotel next time they're over. There's some very serious, like unintended consequences of this decision, though. I mean, for example, say they decide to come over for um, carry out some engagements, that sort of thing. They might do what other um, wealthy, important people do and stay at a hotel. You know, so you get the security. Maybe they're staying at, say, Mandarin Oriental in Knightsbridge, and it will become a circus. You know, we will be able to see the press will be outside. There'll be and photographs of famous people. They'll have to pay right. for that themselves, um, and. You know, previously, when they've been at Windsor, it's been very private. We didn't hear, you know, nothing really when they stayed at the Platinum Jubilee celebrations or at the time of the, the Queen's death. So, you know, that does really, it could cause a problem in the future. This phrase actually came from Lady Pamela Hicks. She said she understands why she's not invited because it's all about um, meritocracy, not aristocracy. It's a really hard one to say. I wish we hadn't come up with that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a very awkward sort of um, motto for a hereditary monarch. Mm. Um, and I do detect, um, call me cynical, but I detect a little bit of a sort of jokey um, response in Lady Pamela's view because, you know, if, if that's the view of our monarchy now, that somehow they're embarrassed by the hereditary principle, that, you know, they're really not going to last long. Um, yes, that so, is a bit awkward. <laughs> yes. So um, I personally think it's a great mistake for them to cut themselves off from um, the aristocracy. So essentially before, you know, we had a sort of social pyramid where the royal family would be at the top and they'd work their way down. And almost the whole point of the coronations in the past have been the various aristocrats have paid homage. You know, to have the dukes. We've only got 24 dukes, but they're making clear that's, that's all gone. The royal family is separate. Mm. It's got nothing to do with the aristocracy anymore, but it does make them very isolated. And when you've got, you know, you've got papers like The Guardian sort of running a campaign at the moment to get rid of the monarchy, if they say, you know, we're the only surviving part, um, it's, I think, I think it's dangerous. And Queen Elizabeth was very much aware of this. When Tony Blair got rid of, um, wanted to get rid of all the hereditary peers, um, she was said to have raised concerns about it. And in fact, then Prince Charles wrote to Tony Blair to say they've got a lot to offer. This is in Alistair Campbell's memoirs. Um, so he sort of said, don't write off the hereditary peers. So for him to undergo this change of view is, um, is a bit worrying. Yeah. If I was Prince William, I would avoid Harry like the plague. Mm. You know, he, he doesn't need to speak to him. He needs, what, what he needs is an apology from um, from Harry first, you know, for all the things that have been said. I mean, where do you start? You know, it's not Oprah Winfrey, it's the Netflix series, his, his appalling memoirs where, you know, William ends up coming out like some sort of villain from that book. Um, so the idea that they'll just have some sort of 
jolly reunion over a celebratory weekend. I really do think it's for the birds. This was a really interesting profile of Camilla, um, head of the coronation in the Sunday Times. Um, and what, what fascinated me was generally royal friends don't speak on the record. You know, you'll often get sources say or whatever. In this case, one of her best friends, it's the Marchioness of Lansdowne. She's a, a neighbour of Camilla's for decades in Wiltshire, one of her great friends. She chose to sp speak on the record. And um, what she was saying was how upset Camilla was by Harry's book, by the things that were said. I don't know if Camilla actually read the book or if she was just told um, what Harry had said, but it had left her um, very sad and um, disappointed. And I'm not surprised because, again, like William, she was the sort of villain of the piece. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a big thing. The decision to, she's obviously let her friend um, speak on the record, suggests that she quite wanted it to be known that she wasn't happy about it. We were discussing a sort of increasing number of claims that um, Prince William should use the opportunity of the coronation weekend to have sit-down talks with Harry, you know, extend olive branches, have a heart-to-heart, -heart, this sort of stuff. And then this is sprung on him that apparently all the reports are that Harry didn't have the courtesy to tell William that he was going to be making this big revelation um, in court where it will be reported everywhere. Um, didn't discuss it with his father either on the eve of the coronation. And it's, yeah, it is a, an, well, I would say a shock, but we're kind of used to this sort of behaviour now. My first reaction to this story was how magnanimous of, of Charles to, to write to her. I mean, you know, anyone who saw that Netflix documentary might remember the moment where um, that um, Harry allegedly received a text message from um, from his brother and he was so shocked that you saw Meghan sort of going over to comfort him and talk outside you know and that was that was William's reaction to this appalling interview and all the dreadful allegations which Harry and Meghan made. We know the Queen's reaction. She left it a few days, let things calm down, and then talked about, you know, recollections may vary. But it looks like Charles did what, what he often does, sit down and, and write a letter composing his thoughts. Mm. And fr from what we understand from this Telegraph report, it was sort of thrown back in his face that Meghan wasn't satisfied with, with his response. Well, in my opinion, you know, she was lucky to get a response from him at all. When Queen Elizabeth became Came Queen, we didn't know what her views were on anything, and and we we still didn't even at the time of her death, and that was very helpful in a way because it meant that people across Britain, you know, whatever their their political views, they, in a way they could always feel like the Queen was on their side, um, but it's much more of a challenge for King Charles because we know his views on so many different things, whether it's from farming or the environment or architecture. Um, so you know, every time there's an issue, we will know where he stands. But I, I think, it, you know, he, he's mature enough to sort of go beyond that and say, OK, but I'm not going to cause controversy here. But, but there's still likely to be tensions, I would have thought. They do seem to have accepted quite a few awards recently. Uh, which the multi-award winning Duke and Johnson. <laughs> it's interesting. Choices. I mean, awards generally are not something which, you know, the royal family accept, but now they're free of free from the royal family's constraints, they can accept as many awards as they like. And this was an award for Meghan's advocacy, I think, for girls. It's from the Miss Foundation. Um, and she used um, the opportunity, this grand stage, which obviously has become even more of a story with all the attention about the um, you know, um, chase and everything out, mm. outside. It's become a much bigger story. And this was all about service, her speech. And it, it's been a real sort of eye-opener because you know, service is something which we very much um, attach to the royal family. We associate with the royal family. And that was emphasised in the coronation with um, King Charles as he entered Westminster Abbey saying, you know, I come to serve and not be served. Yeah. And then that was highlighted in Prince William during his speech at the coronation concert where he referred to that. You know, service, and it was something Queen Elizabeth always emphasised, the royal family is about service. And I think Harry and Meghan, that's always sort of rankled with them in the sense that they think you, d you don't need to be in the royal family to serve. And when they quit royal duties, they made that point. They came out with a soundbite about service is universal. Yeah. And Meghan's return to that theme of, you know, we're here to serve. But 
for me, I don't know, it just made me feel slightly sick, frankly, because, you know, said the service, their idea of service seems to be about service to themselves, service about making money. You know, they left the royal family um, to make money, they wanted to be free to do so. And yes, they have charitable interests, but they also, they mix them up with their personal interests and they always, you know, they're making money as well as serving. And is, that, that, is that a crime? Um, it's definitely not a crime. and. It's something that anyone can do, but it makes me uncomfortable. The whole, the whole th sort of subject makes me uncomfortable, frankly. Richard, an intriguing line from your Palace Confidential newsletter this week that royal sources have told you that, quote unquote, there has never been more relief that Harry and Meghan quit royal duties. Well, just imagine, I mean, you know, Harry has made clear that he now sees it as his sort of life's mission is to, you know, radically change the media in Britain and, and clearly the government as well, judging by his latest comments. So there's just relief that he's now not trying to do that from within the royal family. You know, I mean, it, one of his great complaints, as outlined in his memoirs, it was just the fact that the rest of the royal family and the courtiers and everyone wouldn't support him in, in this mission. He wanted to launch various court cases, um, and they were reluctant to do so. And well, this shows why. I mean, you know, washing dirty linen in public, you know, all this very awkward questions, and, it, it, you know, it's, it's not good. Um, for the royal family or for anyone. So I think they're just very much relieved that he's doing it as an independent litigant rather than on behalf of anyone else. They've made clear that um, Meghan wants to continue this archetype series, which um, you know she thought would be the start of many things. And I'm sure they were hoping that Harry would do his own series of podcasts. Um, and this has been emphasized by a story of running my social diary today about Archwell, because that's their, their brand, and they continue to try and trademark the name. And the latest is that um, they've hit trouble, because there's another company, an American company based in Arizona, that had already trademarked the name for its own um, type of ventures. So, you know, they've got problems with that as well. So it's, it's going to be very interesting to see what they do next. I'm, I'm sure, look, they, they will make more pod, podcasts, but Spotify... Oh, good. <laughs> but Spotify, you know, it's a giant. It's the biggest yeah. company in its field. So whatever they do will be with a smaller setup. This is a really interesting new insight into that. So you remember what happened in that interview with Oprah Winfrey were these, you know, um, outrageous allegations, really, very controversial um, about racism in the royal family with Harry and Meghan not naming. They were just sort of throwing mud out there and seeing where it landed. And, you know, there were great calls for, you know, response from the palace. And what um, Valentine Lowe um, reports in the paperback edition of his book um, is that um, Catherine played a key role in wanting it to be sort of toughened up, really. Um, you know, how that statement, it, it took a few days to come out, and her role in that, um, it, it's a new insight, and, and I think shows, shows quite, you know, fascinating um, side of her character. What he seems to lack is kind people who care for him now, around him. And this is what I find disturbing about his marriage to Meghan, I'm sorry, but someone who genuinely cared for him would say to a lot of these things that, Harry, honestly, don't include that. You make yourself look silly or this is not good. But, you know, when I'm listening to audio last night of him talking about, um, oh, don't, you know, don't. talking about using his mother's I favorite cream say. on his penis, you know, please. It, it, this you say is, that on Palace no, Hill. There's the YouTube no. segment. No, 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 <laughs> sorted. No one, yeah. want, no one wants to hear this. And anyone who cared for him would say, look, Harry, just don't include it. But instead, he's got people who want, they want money, money, money. You know, ghostwriter, publisher. They're boasting about how many copies this has sold. Great. You know, Prince William could turn around tomorrow and write a book, I'm sure, that's even more extraordinary, would make lots of money. But, you know, we've, he's got dignity. Mm. He's not going to do that. I think, in all seriousness, he, he wants to destroy the monarchy. I know he said on the Tom Bradby interview that he still supports it, but I don't think so. I think he's, he's trying to portray his father, who's, you know, yet to be crowned as an irrelevance, an old man just in hock to his um, domineering, scheming wife. He's trying to sort of dismiss Charles. And he's really, his real target is his brother. He wants to 
destroy the very positive image that people generally have of William and Catherine. He wants to do as much damage as possible. I'm not quite clear if it's a sort of just a thing of sort of carpet bombing trying to destroy because he can't have it or if he hopes to become king himself. I don't know. The drugs thing is shocking, actually. Um, you know, there's so much... Drugs are featured so heavily in the book and they play such a large part in Harry's life, really. That's quite surprising when he's had protection officers. Mean, yeah. but, but they are there. I mean, he, you know, he has put them consistently in a very awkward position because he has been breaking the law consistently while with um, police officers. And that puts them in a, in a very awkward position. It's a really interesting point by Richard Kay because, you know, previously it's unthinkable to write, you know, a royal memoir. I mean, remember there was um, there was a nanny years ago, was it um, Crawford, who who wrote oh, a memoir, Crawford, yeah. yeah, and she was excommunicated. You know, it was a real sort of horror what happened to her. I mean, my goodness, even the um, the boss of Rigby and Pella, the um, you know the bra the makers, bra. she just mentioned her work for the Queen in a memoir that she wrote, and she was stripped of her royal warrant. So you know, it was a well, real. You can't be invoking the image of the Queen's bosoms. <laughs> you can't. Yeah. Anyway, it was a real no no. But but Harry's um, you know writing his book has really thrown all that um, you know out there, and it's it's now. I mean, what we've seen is the royal family haven't reacted. They made a point of not reacting to Harry's book. They haven't made a fuss. They've declined to comment, that sort of thing. So in a way, that's um, Andrew could think, well, why not? Remember, King Charles does have, you know, levers to pull. I mean, you know, Andrew lives in a royal grace and favour property, Royal Lodge, you know, lives there still with Fergie in another wing. Well, with a good book deal, he can live wherever he wants. Mm, <laughs> but it's expensive and Charles has agreed to um, keep, you know, paying for security. So, you know, that that's millions of pounds. So he... Uh, he would be very, very loath to upset his brother, I think. What actually matters is that he's still in the line of succession, you know, very senior Prince Harry is. God forbid if something was to happen to the royal family, he would become our king. Um, that should end. He should be removed from the line of succession. And he is still one of those councillors of state that can stand in for the, <laughs> for the king, which obviously is not going to happen in a hurry. So why not remove him? You know, we've already had an act of parliament to allow Princess Anne and Prince Edward to join those councillors of state. Have another one to remove him. It's ridiculous that if you're doing petty kind of changes to the website, deal, deal with the big things and then um, make make the big changes that matter. So Edward Young, who was um, Queen Elizabeth's private secretary for years, very loyal servant, um, but he became very much a hate figure for um, Prince Harry and Meghan. So unfortunately, he was one of those what well, they call them sort of men in grey suits, yes. those officials that were blamed for essentially not welcoming Meghan, not sort of incorporating their ambitions and desires for what they wanted to achieve. And they were sort of blamed with Megxit. So he was described as the B in, um, in Harry's book. Yep. There was the B, the wasp, and another one who... Uh, Better to be a bee. Escapes, yeah. Wasps bee, are worse than bees. Bees not too bad, yeah. but it was, it was the three principal courtiers that um, Prince Harry is very rude about in his book. But anyway, what's happened this week is that King Charles has appointed um, Lord Young, as he now is, to be his um, permanent Lord-in-waiting. Now, it's, it's a great title, but what it means is that um, Lord, Lord Young, as he now is, Lord Young of Windsor, brilliant title, shows what a, an insider he is, mm. and he um, can represent the king at, you know, it's likely to be things like funerals or engagements where the king can't attend in person. So I think it's really significant because it's... <clears throat> I mean, imagine what it shows. It shows King Charles saying, I value my, you know, I've got respect for the courtiers and, more... And siding with, than, and, basically taking a side. Yeah, yeah, and more than he's bothered about antagonising, um, you know, Harry and Meghan. I mean, I joked in my diary today, you know, about there might be some sort of crockery thrown in um, a certain <laughs> um, villa in Montecito. Um, but, but, but imagine what that's like, you know, when you see someone who you blame for sort of giving you a hard time to be then rewarded in this really public way. Mm. So it really does highlight the, the gulf, I think, between um, father and son that there still is. And, you know, for any kind of 
um, rapprochement in the future, it shows what a long way they'd have to go. Let's kick this section off with some royal military moves that might have put a couple of prominent noses out of joint. The King has indeed appointed Prince William as Colonel-in-Chief of the Army Air Corps. That's Harry's old regiment. Is it reasonable to say that um, had things been different, Harry might have been given the nod? It's, it's certainly possible. Yeah, I mean, it's a move that had Harry stayed carrying out royal duties, it w would have made sense. You know, he, when he flew Apache helicopters in Afghanistan, that, that was um, as part of his role in the Army Air Corps. So it would have been quite possible in a sort of natural progression. So I think that really will have, <clears throat> you know, stuck in Harry's craw to see that role go to his brother. Oh, it's not a good week, is it, with that and the appointment of the courtier? And... N no, it's true. I mean, it's, you know, if you just sort of think back to when, um, you know, we had the sort of negotiations about what was going to happen with Harry and Meghan, um, when they announced the settlement, afterwards Prince Harry made a speech because um, he was giving a, a talk to a charity and he, he expressed his sadness about particularly losing the military titles and he, he said explicitly, you know, I had hoped that I'd be able to keep them. He, he saw no reason why he had to lose those. Mm. Um, and, so, and so, you know, it's something which he cherishes, those military links. And obviously having served, it's particularly hard for him to then accept losing them. Do you think that this particular appointment for Prince William seems pointed, given it was Harry's old regiment? Um, w well, I mean, someone has to have that role. Mm -hmm. And um, Prince William, you know, is a natural. Prince William trained as a search and rescue pilot with the RAF. So he, he's well qualified. Um, for that role too. So I think it's great that he, he's got it. It makes sense. Um, but yeah, it's just what happens when you've quit royal duties, isn't it, frankly? Well, also possibly unhappy about the whole thing might be the Duke of York, who saw his former roles go elsewhere as well. Well, Prince Andrew, you know, let's remember, is, is another one who, you know, has that military um, history. He served um, very distinguished. It was very brave, his um, action in the Falklands conflict, where he, he flew decoy missions. It, it really was dangerous. And he lost what? the ability to sweat. Do you remember? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, yeah. Um, that's, deb that's, that's debatable. That's a whole, I mean, that's a whole different ball game. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, no, so he was extremely proud of his military links and his titles. Um, and he's, he's lost those now. One of them um, has gone to the Princess of Wales. I think it's, to, I think it's Commodore in Chief of the Fleet Air Arm. Another one has gone to Sophie, the Duchess of Edinburgh. Um, so, you know, it, it's great that other royals have got these um, titles, but, but it's hard. Obviously, Catherine doesn't have, um, you know, military experience, um, neither does Sophie. So, again, that will be hard for Prince Andrew to, to see that happen. Let's start this section with a comment from the BBC's former royal correspondent, Jenny Bond, who spoke to OK! magazine this week about William and Harry's rift and Catherine's attempts to heal things. Reflecting on the fact that the Princess of Wales comes from a happy and united family, she says, I think she believed the rift could be fixed. And after Prince Philip's funeral, we saw her talking with Harry and obviously encouraging William to do the same. But we now know that it didn't work. And in fact, William and Harry had a blazing row right after the funeral. Richard, if this is accurate, this really does show how magnanimous Catherine can be, doesn't it? I think so, because let's put this in context that, you know, at that point they'd already had, Harry and Meghan had given their interview, notorious interview to Oprah Winfrey mm. that had been broadcast while Prince Philip was dying in hospital. Obviously he died the next month and this um, happened at the, the funeral. Um, but in that interview, you know, they had said terrible things. They had, yeah. you know, really upset the whole family. But we saw Catherine trying to mend fences a bit. I think trying to be just civil, really, just trying to sort of, you know, it's a funeral, everyone's together, probably making small talk, this type of thing. Um, I think that just shows her general, um, you know, good manners and trying to be the peacemaker. As we've discussed often on this programme, it's that smaller monarchy that we've got and the, the bigger roles that are needed for people like Sophie and Edward. And I, I think... King Charles is relying on her more. This was a very important um, part of the state visit, showing the president round. 
Um, and the fact that he assigned that to her shows the the importance that he, he values on her contribution, I think. Richard, I'm fascinated to know what you made of Harry and Meghan. Making it known they would accept an invitation from Saudi. How, how does that work? Who actually fires that volley in oh the first goodness, place? Oh my this is pathetic, isn't it? This, <laughs> this reminds me a bit of sort of at the school disco, you know, where if you weren't brave enough to, you know, ask a girl to dance, you'd sort of say, oh, my mate fancies you or whatever. <laughs> is you that know, how it, you used to do it? Um, I'm sure that never be, happened yeah. to you, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> it was that sort of thing. I mean, imagine, you know, here we're not hearing directly from Harry and Meghan. We're hearing from friends. So, so the story in the Sunday Times was that their friends are putting it out that they really would quite like to be welcomed to, um, invited to San Jim at Christmas. I mean, come on, you know, we, <laughs> this is no way to operate, is it? I mean, perhaps they could invite the king to California or something, but just to do it, we're getting this regular briefing now of, of sort of what they're saying, their friends are saying. It seems to be more and more. Letting it be known through friends, it just really does seem pathetic. Richard, I know you spotted an interesting video from one of Meghan's engagements, didn't you? Well, this was just at the ice hockey match, the Vancouver um, Canucks. Hope I pronounced it correctly. Oh, someone um, will tell you if you haven't. They were yeah. watching and it was just a, a moment captured on, on the cameras there where Meghan was cheering on the team or whatever. You know, and then she's kind of cheering and then immediately looking at the screen to see if it was recorded. And uh, my goodness, it just, to me, it was one of those little things that said so much, which is that at the moment, um, Megan seems desperate to be um, on camera a lot. She's, you know, attending lots of events. It's usually um, concerts performed by other people, such as Katy Perry or Beyonce, or sporting events. It's not really things that she's doing. It's kind of attending, it's being a spectator. It's, it's quite odd. Well, you've also written in your newsletter this week about how you think she might be realising a little bit more of what she's lost in exiting from the firm. I just think what a week. I mean, we've seen the sort of full splendour of the monarchy with the state visit. You know, they really plough it on and, um, you know, Catherine's been looking magnificent. Um, and if Harry and Meghan had stayed, they would have been an integral part of that. They would have been waiting um, for the president of Korea with William and Catherine. Yes, he probably would have been, sorry Sophie, you can stay home. Oh, oh, no, 100%. Yeah. Sophie wouldn't have done that. That would have mm. been um, Harry and Meghan, as we saw in the past. And instead, we've seen Meghan, you know, at a red carpet event in um, Hollywood. It was an award. Normally these big names, they only turn up for events. They're going to be given an award or something. There was nothing there for her particularly, but she was just a sort of another celebrity on the red carpet. And at one point, it was very undignified that someone came along to sort of shove her along the red carpet a bit. And she actually kind of looked like she was pretending it was a friend. It was like, oh, hi. No, no, this was just a woman who was trying to get her to move along because it was the term for someone else, probably a bigger celebrity, you know, next door like Margot Robbie or someone. So it's very undignified oh for a you know, someone who was a senior member of the royal family. Omi Scobie is one of Harry and Meghan's uh, most sycophantic cheerleaders, and he's really taken his cue from them. So, I mean, what was the most striking thing about Prince Harry's memoirs spare was just how unpleasant it was. You know, every, it was just kind of dripping with contempt and poison towards his brother, and particularly Catherine as well. And so I think Omid's taken his cue from that. And yeah, the portrayal of her in this book is really negative, but really weird. So on the one hand, he kind of portrays her as Katie Keene, the kind of puppet of the royal family who will do anything to that she's told. Mm -hmm. But then also, it's kind of, it's not coherent. So he also criticizes Catherine for being scheming. You know, she was always out to get Meghan. She's kind of the power behind the throne kind of thing, which completely contradicts his other narratives. So I thought it's, um, incoherent nonsense, basically. I'm just so curious about the sources, obviously. And Richard, this week, Sarah Vine, a friend of the show, uh, wrote a column in which she suggests that the Sussex should, should now distance themselves from the book and its author very publicly. Do you agree? And do you see that happening? Well, I think they've let it be known um, via a spokesman that they didn't cooperate directly w with this book. So that's, that's on the record. <laughs> Harry and Meghan are Omid Scobie's meal ticket. They, they really are. So he wouldn't do anything that he thought would upset them. When Meghan made those claims um, back on Oprah Winfrey, she knew exactly what she was doing. She set that hair running, and those names were always likely to come out. They wanted it to hang over the royal family. They wanted to do 
as much damage as they possibly could with that interview. And they knew that it would linger, that nasty smell would linger over the royal family. So Omid, you know, whether directly or not, is doing his master's bidding. And yeah, it's appalling, it's disgusting. You've got all these um, people who can't answer back with the royal family. I mean, imagine how, you know, poor Catherine feels. You know, she's had all of this um, sent her way with all that stuff in the interview and the book and she's tried to rise above it um, as they all have um, but it, it's very hard and people end up talking about it because you know it's important controversial stuff wow. i think harry knows he's done wrong and even at that interview you saw him a bit uncomfortable mm. when mm. megan started talking about it i think he knows he did wrong and that's why it didn't feature in the series or in his book and but it, you know it, it's they, out there it's out there and this will carry on happening because as victoria says what people want to know is did scoby get it right you know he's um he's made these claims are they correct mm. well, we don't know some great ones there now one thing we know that richard wants is an expanded monarchy and the king to bring princess beatrice and princess eugenie back into the fold and while they might no longer be working royals they've still had a pretty busy 12 months here are some of our favourite pictures of them in 2023. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. We look forward to bringing you more Richard Eden and of course our other experts every Thursday in 2024. Wishing you a very happy new year and goodbye.